My name is Jeffrey Simler, and I'm born in New York City and I live in New York. I know about the rescue or the attempts to rescue Jews, specifically from my family's towns of Benjamin and Sosnovitz since 1985, uh, before I believe any of the uh, current Polish uh, people, including uh, the Polish ambassador to Switzerland, knew about it, or Mr. Blechner. Uh, when I was in Yad Vashem in 1985 in researching my family from Benjamin, I stumbled upon uh, actual copies and, and original passports from Paraguay and other Latin American countries uh, that were filed and in connection with Benjamin Sosnovitz. Uh, I, I photographed them, I copied them. And also, while I was there, I found the actual notebook, the register, that Dr. Alfred Schwarzbaum, who was a refugee from Benjamin in Lausanne, Switzerland, um, uh, was keeping tab of the letters, the correspondence, and the ordering of passports through, at that point, I didn't know whom, uh, but about 800 or 900 names were listed. Uh, most of the people from the Benjamin Sosnovitz area with birth dates, with the dates that received the letter, he ordered the passport, and to me this was in part also codes that I didn't know and even think about pursuing what happened. In fact, um, honestly, I thought that the problem was that the dates when these passports were being ordered was too late that the Jews of Benjamin and uh, Sosnovitz uh, were liquidated. The last liquidation was in August 1st, 1943. And what I could see is the passports were being uh, ordered in the spring of 43. So for many years, I just assumed they were interesting, historic, genealogical information. But I never really even gave a thought as to how these passports were issued. Um, and early this year, um, thanks to Marcus Blechner, who posted something on Facebook on one of the Holocaust-related Facebook pages in German, I believe, um, it just, I spotted my eye, Abraham Zilberschein listed among the names. And I knew that Alfred Schwarzbaum worked with Abraham Zilberschein uh, in connection with the passports. I knew that Dr. Schwarzbaum's um, uh, archives are among the Zilberschein archives, both at Yad Vashem and also at another Holocaust Institute in Israel called Masua. So it just said, I said to myself, I need to contact Marcus. I didn't know who he was. I thought, frankly, he was a German person or a Polish person. Uh, and I started to communicate with him. And I learned about Alexander Wadosh, and I learned about the Bernese group. Uh, I had no idea about the Polish uh, um, uh, diplomats. Uh, uh, dipl diplomats. I had no idea uh, that in addition to Alexander uh, Abraham Silberschein, there were other Jews involved. I didn't know anything about uh, Rabbi Ice. Uh, however, I, going back, I will tell you that I visited Masua about 10 years ago. And I found another part of Dr. Abraham, uh, um, Alfred Schwarzbaum's uh, archival records. Uh, I found hundreds or 200 letters that were written from the ghettos of uh, Benjamin Sosnowiec and other areas of Poland to Schwarzbaum. And shockingly, I found two letters written by my grandfather's brother. Uh, and that was a major find for me personally uh, one letter written at the end of January 1943, uh, where he wrote to Alfred Schwarzbaum, Dear Alf, everything is fine. How is your wife? Um, and zum Andenken, which means to remember me, I'm sending you photographs of our family. Uh, and I knew that, in fact, the, what, how it worked was that photographs had to be sent out of the ghettos I knew that the Germans were censoring the mail. They couldn't uh, specifically say things. They used code language in these letters quite often. For example, 
um, they would write that everything is fine and we're expecting Uncle Malachamavis to come next week. Uh, Malachamavis in Hebrew and Yiddish means the angel of death. But the German censors didn't understand what they meant. Uh, so that type of communication got through to Switzerland, uh, got through, and the information, of course, got through to the Polish diplomats who relayed that to the uh, uh, Polish government in exile in London. The next letter I found again uh, by my uncle, my granduncle, was dated March of 43. Again, written to Dr. Schwarzbaum, and he writes in this letter, uh, Dear Dr. Schwarzbaum, um, I'm writing to you in connection with my prior letter of January. I have not heard back from you, and I'm concerned. And then, again, I don't, I don't know German, but I know Yiddish, which is pretty close, so I was able to figure it out. And then he writes, and he underscores the next two words, schnell antwort, answer quickly. This was April of uh, 43. The ghetto was liquidated August 43. In fact, before then, there was a deportation in June. So he obviously knew that it's coming close to the end. In fact, his wife, I have a record, my great aunt, was shot to death in June of 43 trying to escape the deportation. Um, so when I found Marcus Blechner and found another man in the world who has a similar interest in what I thought was a very, very uh, small, uh, nobody really has an interest in matter, and he introduced me to Jakob Kumoch from the Polish ambassador to Switzerland, uh, we found out that I had records that they don't have, they have records that I don't have. So just like during the war, it was a partnership between Poles and Jews, we are now partners, uh, Poles and Jews, to uncover the story. And um, contrary to what I had always thought, what we've now learned is that Jews, in fact, from the Benj and Sosnoviets ghettos did survive. Again, through Facebook, I posted something about it, and a woman in Massachusetts contacted me her father was in a, a POW camp in Germany called Tittmoning, and her mother, which or Ilag IV, and her mother was in Vitel, France, in another POW camp, which were just women. And in that camp, she knew her father's former campmates were men from Benjen, and she is working on a book about Tittmoning in particular, where there were both Jews and non-Jews. Uh, the purpose of the camp, the POW camp, as I've learned, was to trade what were viewed by the Germans as foreigners who now were prisoners of war, meaning for regard to Jews, they had passports, here in this case from Paraguay, fake, forged, um, and even though they were Jews, they could be used to trade German POWs in camps in probably France. Um, and that was why if the Jew got the passport in the Benjamin ghetto, in the ghetto, uh, and they came, as I understand, through the regular mail, okay, they just simply showed it to the German official, and they were arrested and sent away. And amazing, uh, I just finished a group tour that I've arranged last week, about 250 Jewish people, from all over the world, 10 different countries, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the final liquidations of the Benz and Sosnovitz, uh, Benz Kamionka, Shradula ghettos. Everybody who came had a connection to these towns. And there was a man there, who I, I never knew him, I introduced myself, he was born in 1937. And I started asking him, so how did you survive? And he told me, well, he and his aunt received Paraguayan passports. So I was, of course, very inquisitive. Uh, I never knew this man before. And as we're talking, he is the nephew of Alfred Schwarzbaum. So not only did he receive a passport, but he was a nephew of Alfred Schwarzbaum. And in fact, when he got to Switzerland, uh, he was taken uh, to the POW camp, to Ilag 4 with his aunt. And then 
Obviously, Dr. Schwarzbaum did his best to save his nephew. During the war, he got into Switzerland, and he saw Dr. Schwarzbaum. Uh, an amazing story. Uh, so for me, history has always been in, of interest. Uh, my history, but more importantly now in the last many years, the history of all the Jewish people in my towns, and I'll tell you also the history of just my towns in general, uh, have, been, have infatuated me. Uh, and it's, um, I'm so happy and pleased that I'm able to help uh, uh, Ambassador Kumoch and Marcus Blechner to, to flesh out the story. Poland is the only country throughout Nazi-occupied, German-occupied Europe where there was no government, uh, no puppet government, no government. Um, the Polish government in exile had nobody who they could, there was no army. <laughs> uh, Polish people had no ammunition. Uh, the government in exile did the best they could as they found out the information of what was happening in Nazi-occupied Europe. I've read the, uh, the book, booklet, that they published at the end of 1942 uh, in English uh, called The Mass Extermination of Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, I've read it in detail. Um, and they try to bring it to the world's attention. Uh, I know very well about Zygota. Uh I know for many years about the story of Jan Karski. Unfortunately, the world didn't care. Uh, and the most uh, poignant um, showing of that is simply Jan Karski's interview many years ago um, when he talked about meeting FDR um, and uh, telling Roosevelt about what was happening to the Jews from his own eyewitness experience. And this is many years ago, before I was even into genealogy or Polish or anything, and I still remember Jan Kosky saying, Roosevelt said, tell me about the horses in Poland. So uh, my father was in Auschwitz. Uh, the rabbis in the United States and others pleaded to the American government to bomb the railroad tracks. They didn't. Um, there was no Polish army. Polish people had no arms. Uh, and there was no Polish government. I mean, yes, there was a Polish government in exile, but really, it really didn't exist. Uh, Poland was at first occupied by two, two major uh, countries uh, and stabbed in the back by the Soviet Union uh, and then and then the whole country was occupied by a very 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 powerful military force uh, and on the other hand if not for the Soviet Union being uh, invaded by the Germans who knows maybe Germany would have won the war um, I personally, when I started in 1980s being interested in the passports, only focused on my towns, Benjamin and Sosnovitz. Uh, in my looking at the records, I certainly remember correspondence and things regarding Chenstochova, maybe Lvov and other places. If there was something, honestly, with regard to Holland, uh, I would have not looked at it. And I, did, I wasn't looking at the, at the whole picture. Um, I understand from my Polish friends that they've been able to document Jews in Holland and other places that actually were saved, including Marcus's Blechner's good friend who wound up living in Switzerland. Um, the Holocaust and what happened, uh, you always have to look at time, when it happened. What ha was happening in Holland at a particular time was not happening in the Zagwambi area of Poland. Um, and I will tell you, and, and I spoke earlier today, among the documents, the, the letters that I found in Masua in Israel was a letter written in June 1943, uh, about 20 days before my aunt was shot by the Germans a letter written by Monyak Moses Merin, who was the head of the Judenrat, the Jewish Council, of all of what was called Upper East Silesia, 
Benjamin Sosnowitz, and the letter was written to Alfred Schwarzbaum. Schwarzbaum was from Benjamin. He was a very wealthy man, and he was a philanthropist in Benjamin before the war. He was able to get out very early. And the letter written by Monyak Merin, the head of the Judenrat, to Dr. Sh to, um, Dr. Schwarzbaum, uh, Merin knew, and there are testimonies where Merin knew about the secret attempt to get passports for the Jews of Benjamin to South American countries. And he wrote to Schwarzbaum, who was the person, the point person getting passports from many countries, not just pa Paraguay, that Schwarzbaum should stop corresponding with the Jews of Benjamin Sosnovitz, and that another man by the name of Schwalb, who um, was also in Switzerland, who was also a key man in the correspondence and working uh, with the Bernese group, should stop communicating with the Jews of Benjamin Sosnovitz. So, and this letter happened in June. Uh, it, it is documented, there are books written, survivor testimonies, that Merrin opposed those attempts. He also, by the way, opposed attempts of Jews to try to get to and smuggle to Slovakia. And he opposed, honestly, attempts to form an underground. But notwithstanding, uh, the Jewish youth of Benjamin Sosnovitz, uh, who were all members of different Zionist youth groups, did have a rebellion um, at the end of the war, before the liquidation, it was not as big as the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but there was a ghetto uprising. And in fact, the leaders of the ghetto, uh, whose names I know, in connection with these passports, passports were issued for, or being ordered for some of them. But this group decided to fight against the Germans. And in fact, if you go to Benjen, there's a bunker and a memorial uh, to a group of seven or eight leaders uh, who fought bad, back against the, uh, the Germans. Uh, one woman in particular, the head of it was, her name was Frumka Plotnitska. And there was another woman whose name was Heike Klinger. Um, and she, she was given a particular mission during the war in the ghetto. Her job that was given to her was to survive. Not to fight, but to survive. Because she kept a diary in the ghetto. And she survived. Uh, she was smuggled out later uh, of Poland and got to Palestine. And her original handwritten Polish uh, diary was translated and published in Israel in 1948 or 9. I have a copy with me. Uh, it was recently, just recently, translated in English, and she speaks about the passports. She speaks about the fighting between uh, the Zionist youth leaders and Monyak Baron and the Judenrat.